Hello, John from the Lib Dem Podcast here. We are delighted to say that this episode is sponsored by Prater Reigns. Now more than ever, you need a professional-looking online presence and website. Prater Reigns have been helping Liberal Democrat campaigns succeed for 18 years. Their Lib Dem Foci package combines a website, social media and email system to help Lib Dems win. You'll receive great support from real people, fair pricing and a huge range of features to choose from. Prater Reigns are already the bespoke developers for Lighthouse, Lib Dem Draw Online and the LD Directory. They combine a talented system design with an unrivaled understanding of our party, our data and our systems. To find out more, check out the Prater Reigns website at praterains.co.uk slash liberal dash democrats. Now, on with the podcast. My secret middle name is Scrooge and actually, you know, like, why don't I just, why don't I just sod off and join the Tories right now? I think, I think that's probably the right thing to do. Hello and welcome to the Lib Dem podcast. We're here with part two of our conference wrap up here with uh, Sam, Lisa and Laura to talk about some of the more controversial issues that came up as part of conference because we could do that now Jeff's gone but we'd like to thank Jeff very much for his time on the last episode and if you haven't listened to that we really recommend it. It gave some excellent insights of some of the behind the scenes uh, discussions and negotiations that were going on with the conference setup. so it's really worth uh, having a listen or having a watch of that. Um, so I think we should start off saying there were a couple of controversial debates you know one's on trans rights one's on ubi but let's start about probably the biggest one which was rejoin the eu and our party's position now i don't want to give the content of our private lib dem pod whatsapp but there was wine being consumed and held breaths during that uh, during that vote so let's start with uh, yourself laura let's start what were your impressions of the the, the rejoin and the the lib dems policy on europe I mean, I think I, I think we've ended up in the right place. Um, I think a lot of pe- some people were concerned by the original wording. They felt it wasn't clear enough in making clear our, our sort of commitment to the EU as a party, our ongoing commitment. Um, for me, actually, you know, reading it in the context of the fact that sort of our commitment to Europe and the EU is in our constitution, actually, I, I was perfectly happy with it. But I do think that the... Um, wording that we've ended up with which makes clear that we have a long-term objective of rejoining the eu but that it's not a priority immediately and it's not something we'll be actively campaigning for in the short term i think is the right place to be um i think that you know that is important because it is who we are as a party and it's not something that we want to walk away from it's something that you know we all feel very strongly about you know i'm sure everyone on this podcast is immensely sad that we were not successful in stopping brexit but um, and, you know, w- we do need to make that clear. But um, I think we also need to be realistic. And the fact is that, you know, most voters just aren't in that place. You know, most voters don't feel like we've really left yet. And to turn around now and say we want to rejoin immediately and we're going to start campaigning on the 1st of January to rejoin, they would just look at us like we were mad. And I think we'd lose any opportunity to gain a hearing. So there were two amendments for listeners that didn't go to conference. So there was a, a, a small amendment, uh, which was Amendment 2, which was to basically remove the wording saying um, all options on the table because it was felt a little bit Jeremy Corbyn-esque. And, we don't, and one of our options is certainly staying out of the EU forever. Uh, and so that was removed. That was put forward by uh, Martin Horwood. And then there was Amendment 1 which was the more controversial one. So Lisa, do you want to talk a little bit about Amendment 1 and what it was asking for us to do? It was saying that we should campaign to rejoin the EU from the 1st of January 2021. It said that the mandate that um, I think the Conservatives had got at the last general election had been met because we have left the European Union and that we should start campaigning from the 1st of January. It was roundly defeated because the way the voting went in in fairly classic Lib Dem conference style, we had a a runoff between the amendments and then a decision about whether to amend the motion and then a vote on the motion as amended. Amendment one lost heavily to amendment two, which was the compromise. It was described by a number of speakers as the compromise motion. The motion was then amended so that we are in favour of rejoining the EU, but we're not going to start campaigning for it from 
the 1st of January 2021. I, I was one of the people who was drinking wine. Um, that's more a feature of the time of day that the debate was held than very much else, but it was quite tense. The, the runoff between Amendment 1 and Amendment 2, there, there were a number of people who said they had been unable to vote, which led to some checking from the conference team as to was the tech working, was it not? Of all the times for people to say I have not been able to vote, it was the most, probably the most controversial vote of the whole conference. It was all quite tense. And uh, we ended up with a result that was a, a handsome victory, I think, for Amendment 2, such that even if a handful of people had not been able to vote, it, wouldn't have, it wasn't in recount territory. That said, the tech had worked, everybody had been able to vote. There was just, as Jeff was explaining yesterday when we recorded the other uh, pod, there was just a delay sometimes in, in people being able to see the voting. So Amendment 2, the Compromise Amendment 1, the motion was then amended and the amended and the amended motion carried. So to, I've got the actual figures. So the, the controversial one on Amendment 1 was defeated 1,071 votes compared to 337. Now, that was, you know, we talked a little bit about this with Jeff, about how sometimes the chat gives a bit of a, a false indication. It's a bit like Twitter not being in the real world, that sometimes people who shout loud doesn't actually hold the majority opinion. But I wonder, we, we need to talk about the, the rejoin, the rejoiners, or that sort of side of the debate. Because there are, there are some people saying, and you never really know if they are actually members, well, if this happens, we are going to leave the Lib Dems. This is, that's it, we have lost our identity. And I'll still get out, and I was having chats afterwards saying, you know, that was our unique selling point, and now we've completely flushed it away. What, what's your views on it, Sam? Uh, well, coming from a place where... Uh, I think we got three members uh, joining our local party over the whole Brexit period. I, I come from a part of the world where this is is the furthest thing from being a, a, a key vote winning uh, aspect for us. I I get that people sort of say that's a, a, a distinct the distinctive thing that makes it but I mean it wasn't even on the agenda five years ago and we have been if you you know take the history of our party we've got hundreds of years of history about far more than this and yes it is you know absolutely in step with our values and and a huge political issue but that doesn't mean that it is our distinctive selling point and it never should be you know it, it is our distinctive selling point to be liberals to have the, 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 the social values that are there and, and the international values. Great, absolutely. But uh, this, is, this is just a part of that. And, and it's such a Liberal Democrat thing to do. Uh, and it, partly it comes from this way of voting on policies through conference, which is great and it gives people access. But it, the, this is the wrong phrase, kind of airing your dirty laundry in public. Like <laughs> you're exposing what that, what would be an internal debate anywhere else and, and kind of like and flashing it out and having people saying, I'm going to resign if this is the case. And it, actually, if you made your policy in private, like people would just kind of quietly be able to say whatever they wanted to and, and, and so on. Whereas I, I, it is a good thing that we do it. It gives us definition, but yeah, it causes that fragmentation as well internally. And, and, and it'd be, you know, there's ways in which it'd be so nice if we could just kind of go, let's not announce a public thing let's let this kind of just progress that you know it might be it's, there's a certain political naivety to doing it this way but I think it's a political naivety that is a good thing for a party to have I love it and it's it's messy and it's complicated and at times it's truly embarrassing but I love that about our party the fact that we have a scrap in public there's complete transparency and we have really heated and passionate debates on both sides of whatever the issue is. And then conference is sovereign. We have a vote, whoever wins, that, that's our policy, that's where it lands. And I think the, the point that Sam's making about have getting not loads of new members, Sam's from Oldham and Oldham is not the same as, I don't know, Bath or Oxford or, or other places where there were perhaps more remain leaning voters. Mm. But we in Hazel Grove are not far away from Sam in terms of um, remaininess or otherwise. 
And we're still internationalist as Liberal Democrats. We're still pro-European. We're always going to be pro-European and internationalist. I think for some of the newer members, maybe, who joined solely on Brexit, it might be quite difficult, actually, to get their heads around why are we not just shouting louder. For me, I think last year demonstrated that just shouting loudly about what we think is important isn't enough to win an election. I think you have to go to where people are and help persuade them over to our way of thinking rather than just shout about them about why, shout at them about why they're wrong. I was just going to say, I think that that point that Sam made as well about um, our values was really important as well, because, you know, ultimately we didn't oppose Brexit, you know, because we oppose Brexit. We oppose Brexit because of our values. You know, it's not the other way around. Um, So I think, you know, it has to be about bringing it back to those values and, you know, saying that if you have liberal values, if you have internationalist values, actually there are people who have those values who voted leave. And actually, I think at this point, we need to be saying to those people, actually, this can be the party for you. You know, we've picked up locally a few people who stopped delivering for us over the last couple of years because they're, you know, they're liberals and they voted leave for actually, you know, what I kind of have to concede, even though I don't agree, is a decent liberal reason that they believe that government should be done as close to people as possible. And that means that they don't support the EU because that's further away. And, you know, actually, you know, I don't agree because I think our internationalism sort of conflicts with that. And there are good reasons to work with other countries on issues where it's a cross national issue, but I can't deny that it's a solid liberal argument. And actually I think we have to be going back to those people and say, no, this is the party for you. And we're stronger together. And I think it it comes back to what Lisa was just saying, you know, there's a creative tension where we have people within the party who will take those values, interpret them in different ways and bring that to our, you know, our policymaking process and our campaigning process and hopefully allow us to come into a better place. And so actually, you know, if we can, if we can bring some of those people back to the party, I'd be absolutely delighted. But I'm also really pleased that we have ended up in a place where we do have that clear commitment to the EU, because I do think that a lot of those people who joined us because of Brexit actually joined us because they were liberals and their opposition to Brexit, like ours, was driven from the fact that they are liberals. I was really interested in the debate itself. I didn't see the first half because I was delivering a training session, which, as you can imagine, was fairly sparsely attended because the main debate of conference was going on in the auditorium, in the virtual auditorium. But I was really interested by the way both sides had organised themselves and how there was a some thought had been put into who the right speakers were to put in cards which i thought was very interesting i think whoever made the point about the the chat not reflecting the balance of opinion i thought was absolutely spot on because it got quite heated and on occasion quite personal in the chat one thing that clearly didn't go down very well was one of the speakers made quite a personal speech about some of the people who were on the other side of the debate and that did not win votes to his side of the argument and I think that's a good lesson for people who are speaking at conference is to play well the phrase in football isn't it it's play the ball not the man and I think that was uh, in a gender neutral way I think that we should remember when speaking from the platform that if you talk about the issues you rather than the person you will get a much better reception from the dem conference and it's about for me it's about there'll always be people and whatever argument lib dems have and we have arguments about everything there'll always be people who don't think you are being ideologically pure enough that is just it is it is the nature and uh, and there'll be some people well if you don't do this to uh, whether that's on climate change or fox hunting or whatever else then i'm absolutely going to leave the party and this isn't the party for me and i think they and you've seen it a little bit with when ed was elected there were these people and there's still actually people and i again i said on our whatsapp group which will never ever become public i said there are lib dems out there who are happy our poll rating has gone down because ed won and not layla at which point you need to have a long look in the mirror and think are you really doing what's right for your party and the liberal future that we're trying to get. Uh, so, yeah, I suppose it, it, to end that is, even if you don't get your own way, just shut up and keep fighting for it, but just don't scream about it on Twitter. Is I'm going to disagree a bit with you, John, because I think, 
I think it's a good and healthy thing to have disagreements. And oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's all sorts of things where you get three liberals in a room and you come up with 84 different opinions on various things. And that, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think people leaving because they work out the Lib Dems are not for them. That's fine. I think it's the performative leaving that grates mm. a little. Yeah. And I think it's using words that you can choose to mean in all sorts of different ways. So using the word liberal in a way that not maybe everybody understands the word liberal can be used or radical is another one or progressive. All of these words can mean to, depending on who's using them can mean slightly different things. So I think it's fine to leave the party if you work mm. out you don't share its values or it doesn't share your values. It's the performative flouncing that can grate a bit. I think sometimes what grates on me is some people will say to me, well, if you don't agree with me, then you're not a liberal. You know, when was jo John Potter is clearly not a liberal because he or, or clearly hates the EU because he doesn't want to campaign right now. And it, I, I'm just thinking, you know what, do one. I've won five elections in 10 years. I, you know, I fight every day for the Lib Dems. You know, I, I, sorry, I'm getting on my high horse. Let's move on to slightly nicer. Well, can I just nice say, you can be a liberal when you lose elections too. Some of us do a lot of losing <laughs> elections and that's fine too. <laughs> I, I yeah, think I've lost that... so many more than I've won. Goodness me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do think though, there is this, it's this, you're, you're completely right to raise this idea of like, how can we disagree constructively? Because I mean, for me, one of the kind of, my my kind of core values as a liberal is this this kind of sense that a lot of the time I'm going to be wrong and I have no way of knowing at the time which of those you know which of the things I passionately believe I am wrong about mm. but you know some of them I am and like that's something that I think we all have to accept and that that sense of sort of slight doubt and slight questioning yourself I think is very very liberal and that's one of the reasons why I like these conference arguments so much because for me it's about going in making your case and if the vote goes against you then like okay so the collective wisdom says i'm wrong this time you know maybe actually it turned you know maybe it turns out that the collective wisdom is wrong but i do think that you know in general if a thousand people think one thing and 300 people think another most of the time the thousand people are likely to be right and the 300 are likely to be wrong and if you're on the side of the 300 you know you're questioning yourself a bit and i think you know if it's if you'll forgive me moving us on to one of the other debates that kind of came up in in conference there was a, a sort of big discussion about ubi um which is the universal basic income which if you're not familiar with there is a previous lib dem podcast that you can go back and listen to um but you know i put in a card and i spoke against that one and of, of course i believed what i was saying and i still believe it but you know you have to accept that if the vote goes against you then you know fair cop that's what we're doing collective wisdom says you're probably wrong on this one but Laura, didn't you just, by speaking against it, aren't you pro-poverty? Come on now, that's really what you would like. <laughs> <laughs> You're, in You're right, poverty. my secret middle name is Scrooge. And actually, you know, like, why don't I just, why don't I just sod off and join the Tories right now? I think, I think that's probably the right thing to do. <laughs> Before I bring Sam in, I mean, it's important just to say with all new members, because we have had a lot of new members and a lot of new members uh, listen to the podcast, is that it's okay to disagree with the party on certain things. I don't think I've ever had a manifesto that I completely agree with. I mean, a classic one for me is when the party started to be slightly more pro-nuclear. I grew up in West Cumbria near Sellafield, and I was always against having more nuclear power because when you have very impoverished areas next to the places that has to deal with the nuclear junk, it's very easy to forget about that final consequence. So I was never on the same page as the party. But Sam, you wanted to come in before, so I'll let you come in now. It was just taking it back to that thing of values all the time. You know, if you, Laura has presented, you know, presented an argument on UBI, but it comes from the place of the same values. And in terms of, you know, where that debate goes, if we have the same values, even if we disagree on, on how that ends up, you know, we still... Um, you know, if, if you lose that particular debate and that particular policy doesn't go your way, it's just, uh, you know, that is a particular extension of those values. And if you can see how the argument is, the policy also fits with those values, even if you didn't necessarily agree that that was the way it should have gone, like, you can still see what is liberal about a policy like that. You don't have to, like, be 100%, oh, my gosh, it's the best thing ever. But mm. you can still see how it espouses those values and you can still you know, follow and campaign on that. And, and when it comes to kind of people going, oh, the, you know, this policy is wrong, therefore this is not the part for me. Like, I'm a Liberal Democrat not because I want to be in this party. I'm a Liberal Democrat because I hold a set of values that fit with being in, that, in this party. And 
it's a really nice short, you know, if my name is on the ballot paper with Liberal Democrat next to me, it's easier for a voter to know, oh, okay, you have those sort of values than for me to have to explain that every time. You know, I really think everything comes back to, you know, if you want to leave the Lib Dems, as you know, as Lisa said, fine. But is this, yeah, I think this is the best way of getting those values out, getting that to the public and letting those values deliver better things for people. And, mm -hmm. and, and if you're thinking about leaving because a particular policy doesn't quite fit with you, I would ask the question, is leaving a better way of getting those values out there and delivering things for people? And if it's not, then you're leaving for the wrong reasons. You know, you're leaving because oh. you're angry about a little thing. Oh, get those oh, values, make it. liberal things work. There are, we're in danger of, of sounding like we're, we're giddy with delight at the prospect of some people resigning their membership. No, and not It's important so. that we say we're not. We'd rather there be more Liberal Democrats rather than fewer yeah. Liberal Democrats. However, there are some people who work out actually that they don't share those values, like Sam's talking about, or that for, for a variety of reasons, it's not the right thing for them to be a member. And that's okay. That really is genuinely okay. But yeah, more Lib Dems rather than fewer Lib Dems. That's what we're here for in lots of ways. So let, let's just quickly just talk about the UBI motion uh, because in the end it had a it had a huge uh, a huge majority supporting it. Now some of the um, when we had our UBI podcast on it, I mean the things we talked about with Jane Dodds who was uh, who summated the motion um, was saying you know this this was an idea in principle that was that was all and and actually weirdly enough i had the leader of the labor party in preston come up to me who actually congratulated the lib dems on doing it so it did have a little bit of cut through admittedly he's on the kind of crazy corbyn wing but you know a compliment's a compliment i'll take it all um but um but i suppose the next stage is the awkward bit with the ubi how you pay for it and the specificity of it I mean, and I think, Laura, that's where I think your kind of argument came into is that bit is still unknown. Yeah, and I think that is still my concern um, in the the motion was very clear that we did need to kind of go away and do that maths to kind of find a way to provide a UBI that is generous enough to provide some of the benefits that, you know, that, that proponents argue for around kind of the the freedom to not be as reliant on sort of on work to how to have the freedom to study to to start new ventures sort of all of these all of these benefits that can derive from a ubi you know it, it only really works if you can kind of get it to a level where it's generous enough for for that freedom to be meaningful um but then obviously the higher you put it the higher the costs are and so sort of squaring that circle becomes extremely difficult um my sort of and that and that was kind of my concern with it in that you know are we sort of committing ourselves to campaigning for something before we really know what it is um so i think had it been a sort of slightly more general motion that was you know conferences and you know supports the idea of ubi in general and is would like to kind of see see concrete proposals with a view to campaigning for it at the next election that's something i would have actually been quite excited about but this kind of i was just a little bit concerned about the kind of commitment to campaigning for it before we know exactly what it is um, but yeah, it'll be now be up to FPC to so the Federal Policy Committee to go away and and try and try and square that circle and find a way to um, to develop a concrete proposal for a UBI that is um, that that provides those benefits. And I think for me, the core has to be around that focus on the the poorest ten percent, especially in society. But you know, actually really at the bottom of the income distribution just making sure that it will be more generous to those people because my real concern is that sometimes we see these proposals like one of the most popular proposals that's talked about is from compass which is which proposes 80 pounds a week and that's less than universal credit so what i really don't want to do is end up going into the next election where we're effectively proposing a benefit cut to poorest people in order to give 80 quid a week to Alan Sugar and you know I'm sure that's not what federal policy committee is going to propose but you know it's this I think it is just a really difficult balance to square and um, hopefully we'll, we'll get to a good place out of it. Lisa it might be just worthwhile because you're I'd say the most senior kind of 
member of this podcast who actually does these kind of federal policy committees and and goes on the federal boards and things like that um what what is the next stage and so listeners know so it goes to a policy committee and what they hammer it out over what weeks months what's the next stages oh it'll be months if not years john um although i do appreciate that you've uh, noted for listeners that my elevated status absolutely does need recognizing you're quite right um the <laughs> Federal Policy Committee, which is hotly contested and any member can put themselves forwards and all members get a vote on who goes on there. And there's uh, real debates about the intricacies of the detail of the, the nuance of the policy. And that, that's people who really, really care about policy and find it really interesting. They will work on it and iron out some of the details. I'm with Laura on thinking that they're the details are needed and I think how a number of people will think about this as an issue will depend very much on the detail. I think for me, so where I spend much of my time in, I don't know, well Zoom calls actually at the moment in terms of federal committee meetings is on the campaigning side and I want stuff that's really simple that we can campaign on and we Lib Dems have never lost an election because we didn't have enough policy that isn't just what happens. Our last manifesto had more words in it than Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And I think we as a party would do well to remember that anybody is only going to know a, a small number of things about us when, when they go to the ballot box. Let's make it really easy. Stuff that we believe in and that represents our values and all the stuff but that most of the people that will affect most of the people most of the time. And so talking about those big issues that people are facing in their lives will help us get cut through with them and will help people think, yes, OK, they represent my values. I'll give them my vote. And that leads us perfectly, not planned, but, you know, sometimes these things happen, is uh, to Ed's speech. Because that's now, you know, where we go from now. That is the kind of starting block of it. This is the... the and. I suppose first impressions really of Ed's speech. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll send over to Sam in a second, but I suppose it was extraordinarily personal. Um, I actually got, I, I was a little bit emotional watching the start of it when he was talking about his, his, his mum and his dad. Um, but it obviously was short. I had a lot of sympathy for him because you can't tell jokes. You can't do it. Just directing it to a, a camera. I mean, Sam's a professional at this. It is very difficult to do. You know, you can get no reaction. It was shorter than most leader speeches, although that might be a, a good thing. Um, but no, Sam, so what were your impressions of Ed's speech? Um, I, well, I watched it back afterwards. I watched it, uh, I, I didn't watch it live. I watched it back on the, the YouTube channel, um, and which is a very odd thing. I don't know if this happened live, because what you saw was like, uh, before he started, like there's just a camera shot of him looking getting ready and that was quite uh, and at the end just walking away um it was a the, so the, that was quite distracting and so it took me a while to get into what he was speaking about and because and uh, it helps that it was quite personal i think because there was that odd distraction like it was almost a slightly gentler speech mm -hmm. um because he was uh, and and that gave me time then to just listen to what he was saying it was interesting. It was it, it was very personal, but uh, yeah, we're so, uh, as Lisa was saying about uh, just too much policy. Like, it's a nice thing to just be able to get a story across. There's all this. We talk a lot about you know creating a narrative, and I think being able to access how you know if we're talking about social care, how his experience as a carer just speaks to that, make, gives him that those values. I'll say it again. Um, and, and access is that. I think that's really important and it's something we need to be able to do better and to do more of. So that's a really good introduction. And, and I felt, you know, I've, met, I've been lucky enough to meet Ed a couple of times and, and you know, get on with him reasonably well when I have, but it did give you a bit of a more, more of an insight into, into what he's doing and why he's doing it. And that can only be a good thing. Lisa? I did watch it. And I agree with Sam about how the format uh, is not like a normal leader speech at conference. And Ed was on the BBC Newscast podcast talking about it afterwards. And it's, we chat for about 20 or 30 minutes. And it's quite interesting if you want to see 
a little bit behind the curtain because he's talking about when you're writing a speech, normally for a conference speech, you'd put in some gags, you'd have the clap lines. If it's you, a camera operator, and two other people in a room delivering a speech straight down the line, it's it's a very different speech that you write. And Sam was right to pick up, it was shorter. I, I was okay with the length of it. I think on occasion, leaders' speeches in the hall can feel um, uh, more indulgent yeah. than perhaps we might want them to be. So I, I thought the, the length felt absolutely spot on. But the, the newscast interview with him was is, is really nice uh, in terms of him coming him explaining his process around it and what was going on with it. And also, again, giving some of that narrative as to why he talked about it and some of his family background, which I think we as Lib Dems will know because we got all the leaflets during the leadership campaign, but people outside the party won't know. And so understanding that he is a human being with who has faced challenges in his life and who has challenges that face him and his family now, I think is a good thing. People understanding... Uh, where he's coming from with things, I think can only be a good thing. Laura? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd, I'd agree with all of that. I thought it was a it was a good speech. It was, um, sort of as Lisa said, you know, it wasn't a kind of rabble-rousing, barnstorming speech that you might get in the hall where you're going to get a big standing ovation at the end. It was, you know, it was much quieter. It was very much about introducing him to the electorate and to sort of commentators as a person like beyond the party and really trying to humanize him and place him in the context of the challenges he faces and placing the issues that he's talking about in the context of the challenges he's faced and I, I thought from that perspective it was very very good and actually very well executed speech I found it quite moving as well um, and you know didn't really expect to because um, although you know the challenges he's faced are you know very very severe you know it's something where as lisa says you know i'm very familiar with it because we've just had a leadership election but he did he executed it very very well and i I thought it was very moving speech and very quite powerful actually and it in but in sort of quite an understated way that i think was more appropriate to both the format and the kind of political and sort of social moment that we find ourselves in you know we're in the middle of a pandemic like nobody wants to hear a big like man the barricade speech this is something that we're all going to be living listening to in our own homes thinking about the challenges that we are all facing with our families right now and i think it you know it shows that politicians are normal people with families too well you know actually i say normal people but well let, let's just stick with with families too <laughs> and i think well and from that we've kind of the direction of the party's head towards this we want to be the party of carers that's now, it, it came out a lot in Ed's speech, it's come out a lot throughout the conference. Now, Sam, what's your impressions of using the kind of carers, kind of, will that cut through? Do enough people care about the word carers is, is, uh, is the way to go about it? Um, well, I think it's, 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 that's an access point to social care. You know, social care is a thing that, that people feel. You know, we, uh, you know, we've all got families, you know, you, you will have someone in your family who either needs care now or will need care. Um, and so him being able to talk about that experience is, is getting into that broader context, is being able to talk about something which does affect everybody, which does have cut through. Um, and, and is something that we have been passionate about for a long time, but hasn't access, you know, we haven't got that uh, public awareness of it. You know, the work that Norman Lamb did and, and you, know, uh, you know, the amount of stuff that he's done on trying to come up with a cross-party agreement on social care and, and delivering that alongside the NHS and with mental health. You know, this is something that has been such a strong kind of element within the party. And we've not managed to convey that to people that we have done more, better and this is a really important thing for us. So if, if talking about his experience is a way of showing people why this is important, you know, taking them on that journey and going, this as a party is something we are so passionate about and, and we can make a difference on and will make a difference on, I think that is a great thing. You know, that, that's what we need to do. We need to take people down that road and show them where our values meet theirs. And 
I suppose I, I obviously completely agree with everything you just said completely, you know, the emotion of being a carer and social care and the failing of that system, but also the cold political reality of it. And Lisa will know this as a deputy leader of a, of a metropolitan uh, a unitary is that the social care system is not far away from breaking completely. And with, Local government finance now in an even worse state than it was before COVID, which was already terrible. Social care will be some of the big things that actually uh, get, will be on the chopping board next for local councils. I think of myself as a Lancashire County councillor, things like the break time service that gave help to carers to give them some time to recover and things like that. Th these have all been eyed up as being removed. So, Lisa, I mean, th th there's a cold re political reality. Is it could be for us to be up in and in front of it, maybe advantageous from a political point of view as well. Even though we should say we absolutely agree with the the case for carers in and itself. So you're right. I think to raise local government, John, and I think local government family, mostly those on upper tier authorities, will have been nodding quite a lot when, talk, when hearing Ed talking about the importance of care and caring, and Sam's right that that's Ed's way into talking about social care. Um, Ed can talk about it with an authenticity that, that not all political party leaders can do, and it's really clear when he talks about it that he's comfortable talking about it and he's confident talking about it. And it, it plays into his strengths, that, experience, that depth of experience he has plays into his strengths. I think one of the things about caring and carers is, is either we, almost all of us, well, we all have been cared for because we've all been children. And most of us will care for someone, either through being parents or caring for parents or relatives or friends or whoever and will be cared for later on in life, there's a really good chance if we get to a ripe old age, we will need to be cared for, um, or we might be being cared for at the moment for whatever reason. So it's something that either, that has affected all of us and almost certainly will affect all of us at some point in our lives if it doesn't at the moment. So it's a way in with lots of people and lots of families, I think, wherever you are in your life. And I think it's, I think it was Sam who said, showing people where our values overlap with theirs and inviting them in rather than what we may have done particularly in 2019 is spend a lot of time pointing out to people where they disagreed with our values and how we were different from them let's let's talk about the bit where we overlap with their values and then and go from there and laura you've you I've mentioned lots of times that we you know, we're not short of policy in the lib dem so conference is over you know, the next next big event is the local elections next year. I don't know if we'll have a spring conference or not, but this is the starting gun, really, for those huge elections. What, what Lib Dems listening to this pod have enjoyed conference? What should they do now? What's next? Oh, good question. Um, so I think that i mean you're right we you know if you haven't started um if you haven't started campaigning for your local elections already then you know probably now now is a good time to start um i think this is kind of the point where over the course of the year we you know we start what what we tend to do is you know start wide and then narrow down so kind of thinking about where you might want to target your resources come the elections in may and um sort of that might be something you know you maybe maybe if you think you can target say three wards locally you know maybe at the moment you want to be campaigning in four so you can kind of bring it down to three nearer the time thinking about where those are thinking about what your key messages are trying to bring that trying to bring that kind of local message in thinking about what the issues are going to be locally and, and communicating with the electorate um, but also trying to think about what the scenario is likely to be for the election next year where it's very very uncertain if we're going to be able to do any door knocking at all really between now and then and um, you know what what the election is going to look like you know we could even be looking at something as radical as an all postal election so um, I think I think if I can, for the second time, I could, I will refer you to another Lib Dem podcast episode. Um, John did an episode with Chris Lovell and Simon Lepore recently talking about campaigning without canvassing. I think that would be a really great place to start. Um, and there were also a couple of episodes, I think probably our most popular episodes ever still, 
uh, was the organizers episode and the young organizers episode are both very good places to start. And if you're starting from scratch, there's also the uh, starting in a black hole episode that's not what the title is called but that's what i'm calling it starting from head. scratch so it's good oh, starting know. from scratch that you just left off the inner black hole part uh, fair yeah. enough um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think I think there's we've got some resources. You know, if you ask some Lib Dems online or join ALDC, you know, there's a whole bunch more resources that you could access. Um, you know, depending on what your situation is. But yeah, I think um, certainly for me, I think conference did provide me the boost I was looking for. You know, I felt a little bit low over the summer. You know, we had the leadership election, but it just you know leadership elections always just bring out the worst in the party and it just sort of gets a little bit depressing to see everyone at everyone's throat and you're kind of thinking like really you know with the pandemic like do we you know, doing it again but actually I think conference has really provided me with the boost that I needed to kind of get out there and get out there and start doing it. If Lib Dems are getting you down get off Twitter is always my advice because <laughs> it's where the crazy people live. Um, just on the the door knocking point and the campaigning point that Laura made the party's advice is is really that it's up to local teams to know their area best. So it's the party had a, a block on door knocking over the summer, really, for, for all sorts of obvious COVID related reasons. The advice from the party now is to take account of your local circumstances. So if you're in enhanced local lockdowns, you might want to think about that. If your team of normal door knockers are particularly vulnerable you might want to think about that but actually door knocking's fine you probably want to go to places where they've got their own front door rather than tower blocks because you want it to be nice and airy and you want to be able to take two big paces back so that you're two meters away from people's front doors i've been out door knocking in the brief period between local lockdowns in stockport i went out door knocking and it was lovely people were really chuffed to see us have a chat uh, whinge about new speed bumps that had gone down um, <laughs> on one of the main roads in the village, and it just it, it was it was really good to be back on the doorstep. I think it's working out what's right for your team though, and um, leaflets will still are, are still have been for ages and are still permitted by the party. So it's work out what's right for your area. But if you've not started campaigning yet, we're now in October, and you should probably be really thinking about it. Yeah. And before we give Sam the final word of this podcast, I think, just to, uh, I might be correct in law, I'm not sure, I think that an all postal vote uh, ballot has now been dismissed. It will not be happening in uh, in, in May. Um, so, because uh, there was a kind of a, a bit of a kind of, oh my word, we have to do that many more postal vote letters uh, kind of scenario within the Lib Dems. So that has been news. Also, for any listeners, there will definitely be no by-elections, council or otherwise, until May in England. There are slight differences in Wales and Scotland, etc. Um, but yeah, so the, it means that May's elections are going to be absolute whoppers. Um, so Sam, your final thoughts on going forward and w where the conference leaves us? I think, well, it, I'm going straight forward to phone canvassing because I literally will hang up on this call and start phoning people. Um, and it's been so nice speaking to people. Like I've done more phone canvassing this summer than I, I've ever done before. And people that are not able to speak to anyone different, they haven't been able to for months. And so the nice conversations that I've had that have not really been political, but a little bit, that's just been a fantastic thing for the last six months. And, and you know, that's then going to roll forward and, and sort of change in pattern over the next eight months to, to elections. But I'm really looking forward to talking to people. I, it, it's, it's not, it's, I've been locked in a house for months with an 18-month-old baby as well. <laughs> it's so nice to get out and to talk to people and and you know you can still get stuff done I've, I've probably ended up with way more casework over the lockdown period um because possibly because people have time to complain about it more i'm not quite sure but <laughs> we've got stuff done for people and then been able to just talk to them about it and and on a local level that i mean that's so much of what your job is fixing the little problems for people get out there and do it and, and, and enjoy it and, and, and look forward to that little conversation you have with someone where they just go, thanks. And that's probably as much as it is, but you've just taken something away that was a little nagging burden from them. That's a great thing for a local councillor to do. Thank you. So I, I don't think I could have ended the episode any better than that. So 
go out, get started. But to all our listeners and viewers, thank you so much for watching this episode. Thank you so much to Sam, Lisa, and Laura for coming on again. I hope you enjoyed conference. If uh, what did you make of our wrap up? Did we miss anything out? Is there anything you thought? Oh, well, that should have been discussed in either of the two episodes. Do let us know. Do comment. We'll even though sometimes Twitter does go a bit crazy, we do actually respond every now and again. Uh, so th- and you can follow everything to do with the Live Dem podcast at, at Live Dem Pod. That's on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Do subscribe to us because we have loads of fantastic episodes coming up me and Laura are going to be doing another one talking about campaigning with childcare which is a really important one and how you can do that I see Laura's already plugged most of the other episodes we've done recently uh, I, she, I don't know if we put it on commission but we should do um, so do go check them out and if you subscribe on either YouTube or your podcast provider you'll never miss an episode and so you'll be fully enriched with all the joys of Lib Dem land so thank you so much for listening to this episode and we'll be back with another one very soon <laughs>